Welcome to the continuing quantum design webinar series focusing on measurement options for the PPMS family of instruments. This presentation covers the general topic of electric transport measurements, including detailed descriptions of both the resistivity option and electronic transport option, or ETO. This webinar is intended as a supplement to the user's manuals of both these options and not intended as a replacement for those documents. The presentation will cover these four primary topics, beginning with the theory behind electronic transport measurements. From the Druda theory of metals, we can express the relationship between the current density vector J and the associated electric field E as shown. The constant which defines the proportionality between these two vectors is the conductivity, sigma, or inversely, the resistivity, rho. Next, consider evaluating the potential difference between two points in this metal using that expression for the electric field. If the current can be assumed to have a uniform density and the potential difference is measured along the direction of current flow, this expression can be simplified. The intrinsic resistivity rho and the geometric parameters of A and L can be combined into a term referred to simply as the sample's resistance, R. This recovers the most common rendering of Ohm's law. For metals, this linear relation between current flow and the associated potential difference usually holds true. To determine the resistance of an uncharacterized material, the strategy typically goes as follows. First, a known current is supplied to the sample. In practice, this usually ends up being a voltage source feedback coupled to an ammeter. Next, a voltmeter of some sort is used to quantify the potential drop along the direction of current flow. Now, with V and I known, it's trivial to solve for R. Some caveats come along with this, however. The operation is only valid if the sample itself is ohmic. That is, it obeys Ohm's law in the first place. There is no guarantee that a given material has this property, though it can easily be confirmed by systematically varying the current and observing the voltage in response. A linear curve implies an ohmic sample. Recalling the expression for resistance, it is clear why this is an extensive property of the material. Its final result depends on the cross-sectional area through which the current flows, as well as the distance between the voltage sensing leads. To compare one material to another, the intrinsic characteristic of resistivity is the relevant quantity. Resistivity can be inferred from a resistance measurement only if the sample has a well-defined geometry. Two common examples of a rectangular prism and a cylinder are demonstrated here. The length parameter L is defined as the distance between the voltage leads across which the potential difference is measured. It is important to note that this is not the total sample length. The second key parameter is the cross-sectional area highlighted in yellow on both samples. This is the surface whose normal vector is parallel to the direction of current flow, indicated by the arrow. For the rectangular prism, this area is the product of the sample width and thickness, indicated on the diagram by W and T, respectively. For the cylinder, it's the area of the circular face, defined by the radius. Care should be taken in trying to quantify these parameters, as they are often the largest source of uncertainty introduced in evaluating a sample's resistivity. The resistance of samples with irregular shapes or non-uniform cross-sections can still be measured, but properly inferring resistivity requires much more work in those cases. Quantum design offers two measurement options which can quantify a sample's electrical resistance. We will compare and contrast these two tools throughout the talk, but the basic difference is the sample excitation mode. The resistivity option essentially employs a DC excitation. The hardware used for this is either the BRT module in CAN-based systems or the user bridge card in systems with the legacy Model 6000 controller. The electrical transport option, or simply ETO for the remainder of the talk, in contrast, uses an AC excitation and a more complex detection scheme. A similar setup was used by the now obsoleted ACT for users familiar with that legacy option. 
Since this talk will discuss both options in the context of their theory of operation and measurement design, these icons will be used to clearly indicate which option the contents of a given slide pertain to. Beginning with DC resistivity, we'll outline some details of how the measurement is accomplished. Despite what the labels used here might suggest, the excitation mode is actually a low frequency square wave, 7.5 Hz to be precise, for systems powered at 60 Hz line frequency. The square wave excitation is synchronized with the line voltage to reduce noise. The primary operating mode is denoted as AC drive, where the polarity of the signal is reversed between successive pulses. Older implementations also featured a DC drive mode, where the current is always pulsed in the same direction. The AC drive mode is generally preferred as it screens for any constant DC offset voltages. Since the sign of the current is changed, the component of the detected voltage originating from the sample should also change. Proper averaging of these detected voltages helps remove spurious offset signals. In contrast, the DC drive mode is a simple mean of two measured voltages and will mistakenly attribute any offset as part of the response from the sample. While the theory of electric transport for a constant current source is relatively straightforward, how do we understand a measurement wherein the excitation is instead a true AC waveform? The question to ask is, what is the expected response for a resistive circuit element subject to an AC current, here with frequency omega naught? To answer this, we employ a generalized form of Ohm's law for AC circuits, where the complex impedance, denoted as Z, serves as an analog to resistance in a DC circuit. This form is valid in the physical regime where a sample exhibits a linear voltage response to a stimulus current. Again, the ensuing analysis is only valid for ohmic samples. As the impedance is a complex quantity, it has both a real component, corresponding to the sample's resistance, and an imaginary component, termed the reactants. In an AC circuit, the capacitive and inductive elements contribute towards the total reactance. The current and voltage in an AC circuit are also generally complex numbers and are written here using Euler's notation. Note the angle phi explicitly denotes the phase between the excitation current and the voltage response. Using these forms, evaluating the ratio of the voltage to current yields an expression for the impedance. Writing this in terms of sines and cosines separates the impedance into its real and imaginary components. This form allows us to explicitly assign the resistance and reactance labels to their respective components of the impedance. This can also be understood in terms of a phasor representation on a Cartesian plane. The real and imaginary components are the x and y components respectively of a vector whose length is the magnitude of the impedance. The phase angle phi determines the direction in the complex plane. It's worth taking a moment to step back from these mathematical representations to consider our initial goal. How can we leverage an AC current excitation of known amplitude and frequency to determine a sample's resistance? If we can isolate the component of the voltage response oscillating at the drive frequency, its real component is the sample's resistance. The tool employed to accomplish this is called a lock-in amplifier. It takes as input an arbitrary, time-dependent voltage signal and extracts the amplitude and phase, relative to some reference, of the component of that signal oscillating at the reference frequency. Much of the existing literature describing the function of lock-in amplifiers builds this device from analog components, a simple example of which is shown here. These employ a series of reference function generators, mixers, and filters to isolate the signal component of interest. The same operations can be performed using a digital signal processor on a discretized set of time series voltage data. This is the method the ETO employs, making it a digital lock-in amplifier. The details of this detection scheme will now be discussed, but are primarily of interest to advanced users. To skip ahead to the result, use the timestamp links in the video description below. We'll start with an idealized sinusoidal current source having frequency omega naught and amplitude I naught. 
The ETO attempts to produce such a source by way of a digital to analog converter. The DAC consults a reference table for a pure sinusoid and systematically adjusts the source current at regular intervals of delta T for a span of times ranging from T0 to Tm. The ETO electronics achieve this with sufficient fidelity that within the specified limits of the instrument, the current source can be considered as ideal. From our prior discussion, generally it is expected in the linear regime that the voltage response should take the form shown here. Note the matching frequency, but the amplitude and phase are introduced as unknowns. From the angle addition trigonometric identity, this expression for the voltage can be rewritten as shown. This form is helpful as it demonstrates the role of the phase angle. It weights the contribution of the in and out of phase components to the total signal. These amplitudes, indicated in square brackets, are constant in time. To simplify, they are renamed Vx and Vy as shown. So far so good, but at this point we are called to contend with the fundamental challenge of real-world transport measurements. That being, quite often the detection electronics used to quantify this voltage couple into other external sources wholly unrelated to the sample of interest. This unfortunate reality is represented in the addition of the final summation term to our expression, now for the total voltage measured. The term looks simple enough, but that belies the complexity it introduces. We have no a priori knowledge of what this term might contain, so it represents a significant challenge to account for in our detection scheme. How does one go about disentangling these signals, then? As it turns out, this is the very problem that this lock-in detection scheme was developed to solve. It's important to appreciate the scope of the challenge here to justify the complexity of what follows and fully appreciate the utility of the lock-in technique. Our next step is to consider our voltage response over some finite interval from T0 to Tm. From there, we imagine a function which takes the same values as our voltage response, but is also periodic, having frequency 1 over Tm. We can represent this imagined function as a Fourier series by virtue of its periodicity. To reiterate, this function extends infinitely in positive and negative time, repeating itself over and over. For the particular interval spanning T0 to Tm, its values perfectly coincide with the voltage response we've measured, which includes the sample response, but also any number of intruding voltage signals as well. At first glance, this might not seem helpful. We still don't know the Fourier coefficients a sub n and b sub n, but there is a utility to this form which will soon become apparent. Even though we've written the total voltage response as a continuous function, in the process of measuring this signal, the ETO's ADC discretizes this into distinct points. They range from T0 to Tm and are sampled at intervals of delta T. Their indices match those used for the associated drive current. We now have corresponding excitation current and response voltage values for every point in the sampled interval. In the discussions of an analog lock-in amplifier design, the reference signal, used to source the current here, and the detected voltage are fed into a mixer circuit, which we can think of as evaluating the product of those two inputs. In the ETO, this is functionally achieved using a multiply and accumulate operator, or MAC for short. The MAC operator takes two lists of values as inputs. Starting with the first pair of entries, their product is evaluated and then added to a running total. The second set is then multiplied and added to the prior result. This continues until the lists are exhausted, producing a single scalar result. Taking a cue from the analog lock-in, we will feed our reference sinusoid and detected voltage signals into the MAC operator, which is mathematically represented here. The next step is to substitute in our generalized expression for the sample response. The result of our MAC operator is quickly becoming somewhat unwieldy, but we will attempt to evaluate it term by term. Starting with the first term, which is just a constant. We can pull that constant outside, making the summation itself trivial to evaluate, since omega naught and all values of T sub m are known. The remaining problem is that we don't know A sub zero, but a careful choice of integration constants renders its precise value irrelevant. 
Two conditions must be true to allow us to ignore the A0 term. First, the ETO electronics are constructed such that the sampling frequency, the inverse of the duration between successive measurements of the response voltage, is high enough to satisfy the Nyquist criteria. This corresponds to twice the highest frequency passed by the analog filters which pre-treat the raw voltage response signal. In practice, this means a continuous function reconstructed from the sampling set is free of aliasing and allows us to claim the equivalence of the results of the summation and integration as shown. Working with the discrete time series data is a limitation of the hardware, but with a sufficiently high sampling rate, we can still leverage the mathematical properties of the corresponding continuous function. The second condition is that the sampling interval T sub m is an integer multiple of the period corresponding to the excitation frequency. If we evaluate the integral then, the second condition allows for the following substitution. It should be clear that, owing to the periodicity of the cosine function, the quantity in the square brackets is and will always be zero. As a result, we find knowing the value of a sub zero is irrelevant, since under these conditions, its term will never contribute anything to the total result of the MAC operator. The task remains to apply these conditions to the remaining terms to arrive at a final expression for the operator. Considering next the second term. The first step is to exchange the order of the summations, valid here by way of the communicative and associative properties of addition. Next, the inner time summation is replaced with the associated integral. Let's examine the term in the square brackets now. The drive frequency can be rewritten in terms of the integer k and the sampling interval t sub m, applying the constraint described prior. With the integral in this form, we can make an important observation. Due to the orthogonality relations of the sine and cosine functions, there is no choice of integers k and n for which the integral is non-zero. Thus, the bracketed quantity is always zero. We have now shown that, regardless of what values the a sub n Fourier coefficients take, the net contribution of these terms to the MAC operator is zero. Note that this is only true because of our choice of integration interval. It does not hold for an arbitrary span. Turning to the third and final term, the analysis here will follow the same steps shown prior. The summations are exchanged and the constant terms rearranged, then the inner summation is recast as an integral. After substituting for omega naught, the contrast with the second term should be apparent. Instead of a sine and a cosine, here the integrand is instead a product of two similar sine functions. When we apply the orthogonality relations, we find a slightly different result. For nearly all choices of integers k and n, the integration is still zero, with the notable exception of the case when k and n take the same value. For that particular case, it can be shown that the solution to the integral is just half the sampling interval. After including a Kronecker delta to enforce the orthogonality condition, the contents of the brackets simplify as shown. The expression can be simplified further, as the delta function renders all terms in the summation over n zero except one, where n equals k. We can now very succinctly relay the expected results of our MAC operation, which has been reduced down to a single term. Can we make any more definitive claims regarding b sub k? Recall the general form of the total measured voltage. It's crucial to note here that we still do not know the value of nearly any of the Fourier coefficients in this expression, excepting b sub k. If the sums are expanded to their individual terms, the b sub k coefficient weights this term. Again, invoking the relation between omega naught and t sub m, we find that this term looks somewhat familiar. Recall the initial form used to represent the response voltage. It suggests that B sub k is the voltage amplitude of the component of the response which oscillates in phase with the drive current. If we permit the reasonable assertion 
that no external voltage sources oscillate at the precise frequency of our drive current, there exists then a simple relation between the in-phase voltage and the result of our MAC operation. While this is a satisfying result, writing this expression in terms of the total voltage V0 and the phase angle phi shows that the problem is only half solved. We have one equation, but two unknowns. The final piece of this puzzle is to evaluate the result of a second MAC operation. Instead of using exactly our reference signal though, we'll instead evaluate the running sum of the sampled total voltage and a sinusoid which is completely out of phase with the drive. Again, a similar expression is obtained by substituting in our generalized form for the total measured voltage. Each term is then evaluated as before. A similar analysis to that used to evaluate the first MAC operator reveals that the first and third terms here likewise make no contribution to the summation. Only the second term, shown here, contributes. Again, invoking the orthogonality relations greatly simplifies the contents of the square brackets. Evaluating this demonstrates that we have now solved for V sub y in terms of the sampling rate delta t and the integration interval t sub m, both of which are known, and the numeric results of the second MAC operation as executed by the ETO firmware. Comparing to our original form of the total measured voltage now yields a complementary expression for the out-of-phase component oscillating at the drive frequency. The in- and out-of-phase components are now defined, so it is trivial to solve the remaining system of equations. Having values for both V0 and phi relays critical diagnostic information about the measurement. It is assumed that the sample circuit comprises purely a resistive element, so the presence of a significant phase angle, indicating an appreciable reactance component of the impedance, is often worth investigating further. The preceding discussion is somewhat complex considering the comparative simplicity of the DC measurement. What do we get for our trouble? The lock-in technique provides two key advantages. First, it provides a reliable technique to extract small signals from large and potentially noisy background signals. This is achieved by the lock-in analysis excluding any component of the response voltage which does not oscillate at the drive frequency, including static DC offsets. As a result, the dynamic range is significantly improved since smaller signals can be precisely resolved from comparatively large backgrounds, and the accuracy is aided by the rejection of spurious voltage signals. Second, the phase sensitive detection is helpful in evaluating the quality of the measurement. As will be discussed later on, overly large phase angles can warn users of potentially systematic errors in the measurement. Next, an overview of the hardware components for the transport options will be given. Both options utilize the same puck. The sample is electrically interfaced to the designated pads on the PCB and these connections are routed to the base of the puck. When installed inside the PPMS sample chamber, these connections can be accessed via the sample chamber wiring at the Cryostat's gray limo socket. All 12 of the connections are functional, which nominally constitute three four-probe style measurements. Note that the ETO is only able to measure on channel 1 or channel 2. The electronics for the DC resistivity option reside in the BRT CAN module. A single bridge card sources the excitation current and detects the voltage. Measurement of multiple channels is achieved via multiplexing. If the module is not already installed when you go to use the option, please be sure to always power down the CAN bay when installing or removing a module. Finally, older PPMS systems featuring the Model 6000 controller utilize an integrated bridge card and require no additional electronics to use the resistivity option. The ETO's lock-in electronics are housed inside a CAN module, which contains two independent measurement circuits, allowing for the simultaneous operation of both channels. As with any CAN module, the user is reminded to power down the CAN rack before installing or removing a module. This is particularly important as the ETO also makes use of a head unit to house preamp electronics for improved noise performance. 
This head unit should only be attached to the primary ETO CAN module when that module is unpowered. Failure to observe these warnings can lead to potential damage to the ETO detection electronics. Now we will outline a typical measurement procedure. While not all samples will be mounted in the same way, in many instances the workflow follows roughly this procedure. The first task is to mechanically fix the sample to the puck. It is helpful to have the sample thermally connected to the puck, since this means the thermometry is a more accurate proxy for the true sample temperature, but also important that the sample remains electrically isolated. There is typically no need to go to heroic measures here, since much of the thermal conduction is facilitated through the presence of helium exchange gas, which couples the sample to the cold chamber walls. One way to accomplish this is to take a sheet of cigarette paper, soak it in diluted GE varnish, and adhere it to the puck surface. The thinness of the paper and the good thermal conduction of the varnish both aid in helping the sample equilibrate to the puck. At the same time, both the varnish and the paper are electrical insulators, so this limits the chances of the sample shorting to the puck's electrical ground, the gold-plated surfaces. This process is demonstrated briefly here. First, the puck surfaces are cleaned with isopropanol to remove any dirt or grease from handling the puck. Next, the contact pads for the puck are tinned by applying a small bead of solder to each. Later, we will use silver paint to make contact to the sample, but for making contact at the puck, solder is usually preferred since it makes a more robust connection. Next, we'll insulate the puck surface from the sample. This is an important step since the gold-plated surface of the puck makes electrical contact with the chamber walls, which in turn share a ground with the various pumps employed by the PPMS for temperature control and chamber operations. This ground can be noisy, so it is best to isolate the sample. As mentioned before, cigarette paper turns out to be an easily sourced and well-suited material for the job. Here we will trim a small piece to size. As far as adhesives, a common choice seen here is the so-called GE varnish, or VGE 7031. It is thermally conductive, but electrically isolating. Here, a very small amount is diluted down quite a bit using a solvent composed of ethanol and toluene and a 50-50 mix by volume. This process is continued until the diluted solvent is a pale yellow color compared with the dark amber it starts as. Once the varnish is quite thin and no longer very viscous, take the paper by a corner and soak it in the solution. Here we will also wet the top side with solvent to aid in distributing the solution through the paper. The soaked paper is then placed on the puck. And a wooden stick is used to smooth out any bubbles. The varnish will fully dry, likely overnight, or in a few hours at low heat, less than 50 degrees Celsius. The sample can now be added to the puck. Next, the sample will be mounted. First, a small dot of varnish is used to secure the sample to the puck. 
This will take a few hours to dry, but it's usually possible to continue work to add wire as the varnish sets. Only a very small amount is needed to tack the sample down, since the thermal conduction via the varnish is not the primary means of heat flow to or from the sample. The exchange gas is primarily responsible for that. Pressing gently on the sample ensures good contact with the adhesive. In this example, we will use fine 1 mil gold wire, roughly 25 microns in diameter, originally intended for use in a wire bonder. This wire can be difficult to handle, but allows the researcher maximum flexibility when trying to mount wires to very small samples. The wire is cut in lengths of about 2 centimeters to ensure plenty of length to work with. Next, the silver paint is thinned to a working consistency. The type shown is a product from DuPont designated as 4929N, which is a silver containing ink, and the associated solvent is 2-butoxyethyl acetate. Add solvent in sparing amounts and mix thoroughly until the desired viscosity is achieved. This can take some practice. Too thin and the paint will run, potentially causing shorts. Too thick and it will not wet to the sample surface and will easily flake off. Here the wires are grasped with tweezers and dipped directly into the paint. The small bead of paint, when its surface tension is broken at the sample, will run slightly to wet the surface, but will still hold the wire. This process is repeated for the other three wires in succession. Current leads are placed at the furthest edges of the sample in an attempt to allow for a more uniform current density closer to the center. As is the case here for samples with a more planar geometry or films on substrates, all four leads can be placed on top, while thicker bulk samples ideally accommodate the current leads on their sides. Voltage leads are placed as far apart as reasonably possible to minimize the uncertainty introduced in calculating the geometric factor owing to the non-zero contact dimensions. Most importantly, accommodate enough room that the contacts do not short to one another, as this minimizes the effectiveness of the four-probe technique in removing contact resistance from the final result. Once the wires are tentatively affixed to the sample, it can be helpful to touch up the contacts with additional paint. Here we do so using a simple tool, an eyelash varnished to the end of a wooden stick. One technique is to shape the contacts as thin lines. Again, this is done in an attempt to allow for a more uniform current distribution. Perhaps more importantly, the contact shape and size should be as consistent as possible between samples if they are to be compared. Additional paint also makes the mechanical bond slightly stronger, which can help prevent wires from popping off on thermal cycling. The next step is to connect the wires to the puck. First, it's actually quite crucial to purposefully insert bends in the wires before soldering. When the sample is cooled, the metal wire will contract. If it is a perfectly straight line between the sample and the solder pad at room temperature, this will apply tension to the paint bond and could very well pull the contact from the sample. The bends allow some slack to hedge against this. Next, the basic idea here is to melt the solder just long enough to use the wire to break the surface tension of the liquid alloy, then quickly remove the heat. It is suggested to use an iron tip which has been cleaned and tinned with the temperature set just above the melting temperature of the solder. If the iron is too hot, the fine gold wire can become too hot itself and actually alloy with the solder, making for a brittle joint. Finally, the excess wire is just gently pulled until it breaks at the solder joint, preventing any stray contact or shorts. The end result shown here is not perfect, but it is an example of a serviceable set of contacts which should provide quality resistance data. Before continuing, it's worth mentioning that there are many different techniques to attach leads to transport samples.
we take a moment here to review a few of them. The plot shown relates their comparative abilities to make robust contacts of the sample with the difficulty or expense in properly fabricating the contact. The most accessible technique for many users is the one we just demonstrated, using a conductive paint to electrically connect some wire to the sample. Versions of this paint are widely available and relatively inexpensive. For experienced users, it affords a fine degree of control to make very small and precise contacts, but the trade-off is that their mechanical strength is quite poor. Overall, silver paint works well for a wide range of materials. A similar approach is to use conductive epoxy. This material also affords some control over the contact shape and size, and the bond is far more mechanically strong. Whereas the paint is a more temporary bond, the epoxy should be treated as permanent. Most of these epoxies only properly cure at higher temperatures, so consider the impact to the sample when subjected to such heat. Like the paint, the epoxy performs decently for a wide variety of materials. Another readily available technique is to solder wires directly to the sample. Most labs have lead, tin, solder, and irons available, and when properly made, these joints are very mechanically robust. Unfortunately, many samples have poor solder ability, so this will only work for a subset of materials. Note in some cases, such as semiconductors, the choice of soldering material can be crucial to creating a proper ohmic contact. As a corollary, a variety of deposition techniques exist, which allow for many materials to have metallic contacts added to their surface. This enables other techniques, including soldering, to be used, but challenges still exist in creating quality contacts, and the requisite equipment can be expensive and challenging to operate. If a metallic interface can be successfully deposited, Wire bonding is a convenient method of interfacing the sample with the puck. Usually a flat surface is needed to bond to, and again, the availability of equipment and training are common challenges. The bonds themselves are reasonably strong, but the wire used is typically quite fine and can easily break under macroscopic strain. Similar to solder, various welding techniques make for highly robust contacts to a sample but only if the material is compatible with the weld technique chosen. The sample is also likely subject to more extreme thermal strains, the impact of which should be carefully assessed. With the leads attached now to both the sample and the contact pads, it's usually worth taking a few moments to make some checks at room temperature before installing the puck in the cryostat. First, install the puck in the P150 utility box which was included with your quantum design based system. It's helpful as well to apply the user bridge overlay, which labels the banana jack sockets as to which pads on the puck they correspond with. A basic handheld digital multimeter is next used to check the various permutations between the four contacts connected to the sample. Keep an eye on the reported values for each measurement. The precise value itself is not especially crucial, but they should all be comparable. The purpose of this is to catch poor contacts. If several measurements with a common contact are all significantly higher or lower than the rest, this can suggest that that contact is poor or shorted and needs to be repaired or remade. The four probe method is robust against modest variations in lead and contact resistances, but it's best to attempt the measurement with the most ideal contacts as is reasonably possible to avoid systematic errors. Once the lead checks appear reasonable, the puck is now ready to be installed in the cryostat. Before we can activate the software, the appropriate hardware should be installed. As with all CAN modules, the power to the rack should first be turned off. Doing so allows the module to be installed without risking damage to the internal electronics. Shown here, the ETO module is installed and the thumb screws are tightened to secure it. The BRT module follows the same general procedure. Whereas the BRT module only uses a single cable for the resistivity option that connects directly to the gray limo, the ETO has two cables connecting the module to the preamp head unit, an auxiliary cable which drives a cooling fan on the unit, and the main DB25 cable which facilitates the sample excitation and detection.
Both cables are labeled to indicate which end connects where. Before connecting the module cables to the head unit, confirm the module is still powered off. Finally, connect the head unit to the gray limo on the cryostat, aligning the indicators on the cable to the 12 o'clock position on the sockets. Note that the ETO ships with hook and loop adhesive pads, which allow the head unit to be semi-permanently affixed to a more convenient location, rather than simply sitting on top of the system as shown here. It is now safe to repower the module bay. From within MultiView, activate the option software from the Option Manager dialog. In the example shown here, we're starting the ETO. The sample installation wizard can of course be used, but for either option it's also acceptable to just manually vent the sample space, provided the temperature has been set to 300K and the magnetic field has been ramped down to zero. With the chamber venting, next load the sample puck onto the extraction tool as shown. Flipping the switch on the end of the tool as demonstrated will secure the puck inside the extraction tool. Remove the baffle set from the chamber and set it aside. The extraction tool may now be used to install the sample into the chamber. Before inserting, Note the position of the key on the puck. When this points in the direction indicated by the arrow, the puck will fully seat in the socket at the base of the chamber. Remove the extraction tool and replace the baffle set. Note that since most transport measurements are executed with exchange gas in the chamber, there is no need to include the contact baffle. Replace the clamp on the KF flange. Returning to the MultiView software interface, we now need to pump and purge the sample space. This operation will evacuate the sample space, then flush it with pure helium gas, and repeat this three times to remove any air or moisture from the sample space. When it is complete, the pressure typically reads between 10 and 15 torr, indicating a small amount of gas remains to mediate thermal exchange between the sample and the chamber itself. Next, we will prepare a basic measurement using the ETO. As a general practice, it's a good idea to make a quick check to be sure the sample gives an ohmic response. This can be easily confirmed by collecting an IV curve. Click the measurement tab of the main ETO console window, select IV, and then press the launch measurement button. In the new dialog, select the channel to be measured and the maximum current to be sourced. The waveform type can also be selected though this is usually only important for testing devices with nonlinear or otherwise hysteretic IV curves. The gain setting should approximate the voltage magnitude expected based on the estimated sample resistance, assuming an ohmic response, of course. If this is not known, choose a large value and systematically increase the gain to improve the signal to noise. Click the measure button to collect the data. When complete, the results will be shown on the status tab of the main console. Even a quick by eye evaluation for linearity gives us confidence going forward that the sample was properly mounted and it is well suited for a standard resistance measurement. If this result is excessively noisy and or nonlinear, check that an appropriate gain was used. Note too that many semiconductor materials present unique challenges as far as ohmic contacts are concerned and may require more careful preparation. Assuming the sample looks OK so far, we'll next run a quick resistance measurement at 300K. Again, from the measurement tab, launch the resistance version this time. Check the Enable Measurement box on the appropriate channel and then choose the excitation. Unless you have a specific reason not to, 
select the Auto Range box to allow the software to apply the optimal gain. Press Measure and review the reported value. Sometimes the phase angle will be larger than a few degrees. Often lowering the amplitude and or the excitation frequency is a simple fix for this problem. If it does not resolve the issue, a more careful evaluation of the wiring scheme may be necessary. If you're interested in setting up a DC measurement, the interface is somewhat different. The bridge configuration menu presents three available channels with a few key settings. For present implementations of CAN-based resistivity encountered on the Dynacool, the drive mode is locked to AC. The calibration mode determines if the bridge circuit also measures a high precision reference resistor to quantify any offsets and improve accuracy, at the expense of some added measurement time. The remaining three fields set limits on the excitation source to the sample. Consider the following example of a 100 ohm resistor. On the x-axis is the excitation current, and in gray, the left y-axis plots the detected voltage. As expected for an ideal resistor, the response is linear. Additionally, the right y-axis tracks the dissipated power, which increases quadratically with rising current. In thinking about these bridge limits, it's helpful to imagine for each measurement that the bridge firmware starts at zero current and systematically increases it until one of the limits is reached. For example, a current limit of 7 milliamps simply means the current will not exceed that threshold. If, however, we add in a 600 millivolt voltage limit at the same time, this would become the limiting factor and the current is held to 6 milliamps. Finally, a power limit of 2 milliwatts would bring this down to about 4.4 milliamps. This system is rather complex, and so it invites the question, in what scenario would these settings be useful? For the simplest implementation, just checking the box for constant current mode will put the voltage and power limits at their maximum values, allowing the user to directly control the current excitation. Often, this mode is good for quick checks or for samples where the resistance is not expected to change very much over the range of the measurement. For samples whose resistivity might change by several decades, subject to variation in temperature or magnetic field, the voltage limit can be useful. Refer to the gray data in the plot at right. For constant current, the dissipated power is linear in resistance. For insulating samples, this can potentially result in such large self-heating load that the sample chamber cannot cool to the desired temperature. In these cases, it's far better to voltage limit the sample. The red data shows that for a constant voltage, the power dissipated falls off inversely with rising resistance. Similarly, for highly metallic samples whose resistance drops drastically with cooling, the voltage limited mode is also useful. Recall that, due to the nature of the measurement, voltage is the fundamental quantity measured to infer resistance. There exists a lower limit to voltages which can be reliably detected. Voltage limiting the sample ensures that the current is adjusted to maintain constant signal size across the full range of the measurement for more uniform noise performance. Lastly, the power limit can be helpful in protecting samples, often devices, from seeing more power than they can handle, thus preventing damage to these delicate samples. With either the AC or DC parameters initially determined, we can now move to put together a basic sequence to measure our sample. The button at the far left of the toolbar will open a new blank sequence. Since our sample in this demonstration has a superconducting transition around 9 Kelvin, to resolve it, we can first quickly cool the system down to just above the critical temperature. We'll also use a wait command to make sure the software holds for the temperature to stabilize at the target before proceeding. From there, a new data file is created to record this data. The actual measurement consists of a scan temperature command spanning from 9.4 to 9.1 Kelvin. At uniform intervals of 6 millikelvin, this command will execute whatever others we nest inside.
In this case, we only need a single ETO resistance measurement command, which will use the same excitation parameters determined from our initial room temperature test. An analogous measurement command exists for the DC option as well, with settings mirroring those found in the bridge setup dialog. The sequence must be saved before it can run. It's often helpful to keep the sequence in the same directory where the data files are saved, making it easier to determine after the fact what commands provided a particular set of data. With the sequence now saved, it can be run, and the system will collect the data without further assistance. To finish up, we'll take a closer look at the results of this ETO measurement to see how the phase information can give us a more complete picture of the sample's response. Looking at the completed data set, we note for our particular sample here, the transition to the superconducting state appears to be complete by about 9.25 Kelvin. In the normal state, we observe a small but positive resistance and a phase angle of less than one degree. In the superconducting state, however, two unexpected values can be observed. First, if we look closely, the resistance actually returns a slightly negative value for a portion of the superconducting state's temperature domain. We know this is technically non-physical. Second, around the same point, the reported phase angle is right around 90 degrees. Earlier, it was suggested that data is generally reliable when the phase angle is a few degrees or smaller. So what's happening? These seemingly strange results are actually consistent with our understanding of the technique but do invite us to think more carefully about how we interpret the output of our AC measurement. Recall that the ETO hardware is directly measuring the in and out of phase components of the voltage response oscillating at the drive frequency. The resistance and phase angle themselves are only derived quantities. For resistance, the interpretation is straightforward. Since our excitation current amplitude is constant, the resistance going to zero or even below simply corresponds to the in-phase voltage behaving in the same way. The small negative voltage values can be understood as errors resulting from the finite resolution of our MAC operators discussed prior in the theory section. This sign change holds no physical significance here. The phase angle, on the other hand, is slightly more complex. While we don't have any a priori knowledge of the sources of the reactive component in our AC circuit, we here assume that they originate from outside the bulk response of the sample. If that were true, we would expect the quadrature voltage to be relatively insensitive to the superconducting transition, which appears to be the case. Given that, we can ask what the expected phase angle is when Vy is roughly constant and Vx is rapidly approaching zero. As their ratio tends towards a large value, the arctan function will approach 90 degrees, consistent with the reported values in the data file. One outstanding issue remains, though. The arctangent function's range only spans negative 90 to positive 90 degrees. So how do we wind up with a phase greater than 90? Recall our phasor representation. For positive values of Vx, the arctangent function is sufficient, since phi is bounded to the same range plus 90 to negative 90 degrees. What if the in-phase voltage component takes a negative sign, though? If we allow Vx and Vy to take arbitrary values, our phasor representation suggests that the angle should be able to range from 0 to 360 degrees. In fact, it's quite realistic that such a scenario might arise. Consider the response of a sample wired up to measure the Hall voltage, where, depending on the lead arrangement and the direction of the magnetic field, it's entirely possible that the measured voltage may result in a negative Vx. For the ideal case of Vy being near zero, this vector should return a phase of roughly 180 degrees. But the bare arctangent function would instead report a phase near zero. To resolve this, the two-argument arctangent, denoted as a tan 2, is used in its place. This function replicates the behavior of the arctangent for positive Vx values. But when Vx is negative, separate branches ensure that the phase vector is placed in the proper quadrant. We can see here that our example places us left of the y-axis, 
since the ratio of vy to vx is negative, and in the upper branch, since vx itself is negative. This correctly returns a phase of roughly 180 degrees, which matches our expectation. Going back to our example data in the superconducting state, the a tan 2 function clearly explains why the reported phase angle slightly exceeds 90 degrees when vx dips below zero. As stated earlier, most basic resistive samples will simply look like the normal state shown here with a phase near zero. A deeper understanding of how these values are calculated though can be essential when using the phase angle as a tool to diagnose measurements exhibiting unexpected behavior. A final topic worth briefly touching on is the ETO's high impedance mode. To this point, our discussion and examples have focused largely on the standard four-wire mode, where the current is sourced to the sample and the voltage response is measured. The wiring diagram is as shown. In this configuration, the ETO can measure between 10 microohms up to 10 megaohms. To expand the dynamic range, the ETO can also operate in a high impedance mode using a two-wire configuration. For materials with larger resistances, an AC voltage is instead sourced, and the same lock-in technique is applied for the resulting current signal. The fundamentals of the analysis are essentially the same, but in this mode, the range is now extended all the way up to 5 gigaohms. The primary difference is that an alternate wiring scheme is required, using just I plus and V minus. For a sample set up for 4 wire, it is not sufficient to simply change the configuration setting in the ETO software menus. The V plus and I minus wires must be disconnected from the circuit for the two wire high impedance mode to function properly. While technically this does reintroduce systematic errors owing to the wire and lead resistance, the assumption is that these will be insignificant in comparison to the sample resistances accessible in the high impedance mode. Hopefully this has served as a helpful primer in introducing the two QD measurement options for characterizing electronic transport. If, after reviewing the user's manual and this presentation, there are still outstanding questions, please feel free to reach out to the applications group to continue the discussion. Thank you very much for your time.